TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. Israel Central Elections Committee released the final results of Tuesday's election, projecting further instability to Jerusalem's political establishment. The U.S. State Department announces its decision to resume financial aid for the Palestinians in the West Bank and the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan hosted Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi as relations between Turkey and China evidently deepen. Israel's Central Elections Committee released the final results of Tuesday's elections last night, with a voter turnout of 67.4%, the lowest it has been since 2013. The final tally confirms that once again, neither opposing political bloc has managed to secure a required majority of at least 61 mandates out of Parliament's 120 seats to form a viable coalition. Outgoing Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu's Likud managed to attain 30 seats, followed by Yair Lapid's centrist Yesh Atid party with 17. The ultra-Orthodox just won nine mandates. Outgoing alternate Premier and Defense Minister Benny Gantz's Blue and White secured eight. United Torah Judaism, Yamina, the Labour Party and Israel Beitenu with seven seats each. The Religious Zionist Party, the Joint List, Meretz and New Hope with six seats apiece. And the United Arab List was listed last with the minimum attainable of four mandates. The results represent 57 seats for the bloc seeking to replace Prime Minister Netanyahu after 12 consecutive years in office, while the Israeli leader's loyal allies managed to secure a total of 52 mandates. Separately, Naftali Bennett's right-wing Yamina party and Mansour Abbas's Islamist United Arab List faction have not yet announced their intentions regarding support to either political bloc. Per Israeli law, the results will be published officially next week on Wednesday and will be submitted to President Reuven Rivlin, who is expected to assign the task of forming the next government to be Yamin Netanyahu's chief rival, Yair Lapid. Sources close to Lapid reveal that he is determined to form a government, yet members of the so-called anti-Netanyahu bloc are deliberating an initiative to replace the Speaker of Parliament by a vote which would then pave their way to subsequently pass a bill that will prevent any person indicted for criminal offenses from forming a government. If passed, it would effectively mean that Netanyahu would be forced to step down until his legal proceedings attain a court ruling clearing his name. Meanwhile, in the West Bank village of Tubas, Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammad Shtaye responded for the first time to the election results in Israel saying that any prime minister who would emerge from Israel's election should be willing to end the occupation of what the United Nations classifies as Palestinian territories. Meanwhile, at the UN headquarters in New York, the World Body Security Council held a meeting to discuss, quote, the Palestinian question. In a briefing to the council on the time period between December 11th and March the 23rd, UN Special Coordinator for the Mideast Peace Process, Tor Venislant, reported on the implementation of Resolution 2334, which was adopted on December 11, 2016, when the Obama administration instructed his representative to the Security Council to abstain from the vote, effectively setting precedence on the legality of Israeli settlements constructed in disputed territories namely the West Bank and East Jerusalem, merely one month before leaving office. Security Council Resolution 2334 calls on Israel to immediately and completely cease all settlement activities in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem, and to fully respect all of its legal obligations in this regard. Venice Lund went on to voice his deep concern over Israel's continued expansion of settlements, which in his perspective arose the prospects of establishing an internationally aspired Palestinian state on lands which the United Nations has evidently preordained to be Palestinian. I am deeply concerned 
by continued Israeli settlement expansions, particularly into highly sensitive areas, which entrench the Israeli occupation, erode the possibility of a contiguous, independent, and viable Palestinian state, and further threaten the prospects of achieving a two-state solution. I reiterate that settlements have no legal validity and constitute a flagrant violation of international law. The United Nations Special Envoy went on to underscore the devastating effects of the corona crisis in the Palestinian territories. In addition to the brutal impact on public health, the recurrent lockdowns, school closures and reduction of commercial activity have severely undermined living conditions. In view of these challenges, I commend the Palestinian government's efforts to plan and implement its vaccination campaign. UN agencies, in particular WHO, UNICEF and UNRWA, and their partners will continue to support vaccination efforts. Israeli facilitation of vaccine delivery remains essential, and I appreciate this cooperation. In related news, the U.S. State Department announced in a written statement its decision to resume financial aid for the Palestinians in both the West Bank and the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip. The statement read, quote, the U.S. government is pleased to announce $15 million in humanitarian assistance for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The U.S. Agency for International Development, commonly referred to by its acronym USAID, is providing these funds to address the most urgent, life-saving humanitarian needs in the West Bank and Gaza, specifically earmarked for efforts in health care facilities in affected communities throughout the aforementioned territories. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden joined EU leaders via video conference for the opening session of the two-day European Council's Leadership Summit, which concluded earlier today. Among the many topics on the agenda, including Russia and China, the European Union deliberated on its relations with neighboring Turkey, including vis-à-vis -vis its offshore energy exploration activities and waters disputed with EU member states, Greece and Cyprus, in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean seas. After threatening Turkey with sanctions, Ankara withdrew its exploration vessels, engaged with Greece in exploratory diplomacy, and toned down its rhetoric. However, the situation remains fragile. Therefore, the EU decided to engage with Ankara in a so-called carrot-and-stick approach. Since the December European Council, Turkey has shown a more constructive attitude, including in its bilateral relations with several EU member states. These are positive and welcomed steps on which we must try to build on. However, we also know that this progress of de-escalation remains fragile. We will further engage with Turkey on issues such as migration financing, high-level dialogues, and modernizing the customs union. If Turkey does not move forward constructu constructively, if it returns to unilateral actions or provocations, in particular in the Eastern Mediterranean, of course, we would suspend these cooperation measures. Meanwhile in Ankara, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan hosted Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi as relations between Turkey and China evidently deepen. The visit comes as Beijing approved an extradition treaty between the two nations in December of last year. It is interesting to know that the Chinese top diplomat is currently on a tour of the Middle East. After concluding a visit in Saudi Arabia on Wednesday, which came prior to his visit to Turkey yesterday, Minister Wang Yi traveled to the Islamic Republic of Iran today where he held a series of meetings with top Ayatollah regime officials. Thank you for watching us. As part of TV7 Israel's prayer initiative, I would like to encourage you today to join myself and the team here in Jerusalem to lift up China in prayer for its salvation and peace, alongside prayers for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, in addition to our ongoing prayers for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of Israel. Jonathan Essen wishing you a Shabbat Shalom and Chag Pesach Sameach. We will see you again on Monday at the same time.